Hi, my name is Eric Vespi. I'm the resident movie nerd at uh, Rooster Teeth's The No. Uh, and I am out here in L.A. I came out for the uh, premiere of Disaster Artist, uh, which was last night at the historic Chinese theater. Um, and uh, if you don't know, The Disaster Artist is about the making of The Room, uh, which is a legendarily bad movie. Um, so I thought, who better to talk to about legendarily bad movies than Paul Shear? <laughs> and uh, and here he is. This is Mr. Paul Shear. I am very excited to be here. First of all, I want to say that I am a huge fan of yours. So I'm, oh, I, I make sure I, I don't let you down. You, you better not. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm watching you. But I'm I know that notes. you you're you know obviously you're a movie nerd, and no. I'm curious because you know the room the disaster artist is a movie about the making mm -hmm. of the room, and I think sometimes when you make movies about making movies. Mm -hmm. It can kind of fall. It can kind of go either way, and mm. I think that um, I wanted to see what your take of this was. Where does this fall in the pantheon of movies about movies? Uh, it's it's way up there, actually. It's definitely better than The Artist, which won Best Picture. <laughs> so so I think that uh, you're already uh, <laughs> uh, ahead of the curve there. Uh, no, my first reaction because I saw it at South by Southwest okay. th was the first time. So this was my second time last night, um, and it kind of just cemented for me that it is kind of in that pantheon of Ed Wood. You know, because yeah. the secret is that it's it's a movie about a character who should be silly and is silly, but it's got there's so much earnestness and heart to him, which is exactly what uh, made Tim Burton's Ed Wood so well, so good. You know, I think what's really interesting is um, whether or not the room was made, this movie still works in a mm. way. You know, it it because it's it's really about the relationship between uh, Tommy Wiseau and Greg Sestero. Mm -hmm. You know, and these are the driving forces of the room if without one you wouldn't i don't think you would have ever if there was no greg i don't think there would have been a room i think that everyone would have walked off or left and i think you know greg really kept that movie kind of moving forward and uh so i think that was like an interesting way of the way they tackled it it's like it's really about the relationship first and yeah. the hardest thing to do you know ed wood i I don't know what ed wood sounded like or if he sounded exactly like the way that johnny depp did it but tommy yeah. I mean, he is a, a caricature to a certain degree. As a person, yeah. Yeah, it's sure. like, like meeting Tommy is like meeting Mickey Mouse because he is this larger-than-life <laughs> character. It's like if Borat was real, it could, you know, like that kind of a thing. So when you're watching the movie a lot of the times, you're like, oh, that's ridiculous or that's unbelievable. And you go, no, 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 that is exactly, you know, every little bit of, of him is that. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting because I've talked to a lot of people who go, do you need to see The Room before seeing this, I don't think so. this movie? And for the people that go in fresh, yes. I think they're going to think it's over the top. Yes. And then they're going to get to the end. Mm -hmm. And, at, you know, no, it's not a spoiler thing, but at the end they do a side-by-side -side split yeah. scene comparison. And you realize that, if anything, Franco is a little bit downplaying sometimes of, of how crazy Tommy actually well, is. Well, and that's the thing. I think like at the end when you see the side-by-side, -side, you're like, Oh my God! It was real. It was totally real. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, you know. I will say to people out there, if you do see the disaster artist, which I think you should, make sure you stay until the bitter end <laughs> for a uh, post-credit tag. It's kind of like their uh, version of like a Marvel tag yes. at the end. It's well worth the wait. I want to spoil it, but it, it's it's uh, it's something that needs to be seen. Uh, yeah, and I think we can safely say who should be Nick Fury if Sam Jackson ever leaves. <laughs> now, after you watch it, I think you know it. Um, so uh, it's funny. Uh, I at the party last night, I actually ran into uh, Robert Picardo. Oh wow! And I'm like, I had to geek out about Joe Dante stuff with him, oh, of course, yeah. and tell him how Inner Space, like him playing cowboy in Inner Space, kind of scarred me as a kid. By the way, Robert Picardo, I love, and I actually put on my show NTSF SDSUV. <laughs> he was uh, one of my favorite guests I've ever had. Yeah. Yeah. So I I, I bugged him uh, and. Uh, uh, and he kind of confided in me that he had no idea really what the room was. Oh, really? When he saw the movie, and he literally said that he thought it was uh, a movie about the making of the Brie Larson movie. You know, and we talk about that all the time. It, you know, it's hard to describe what the disaster artist is about because yeah. you go, oh, it's about the making of the room. And now up until, <laughs> you know, <laughs> last year, that wasn't a problem because yeah. there wasn't a highly successful film called The Room yeah. or Room. Um, yeah. But I still think that The Room is not something in mainstream culture. It's not like, oh, we made a movie about the making of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. At least people yeah. understand what that is. The Room is still like a very niche kind of uh, experience, if you will. Like, you know, yeah. so and I, I, I think that uh, if anything, this movie will open 
it up to a much wider audience. It's going to open the door to the room. Is that what you? Yeah, mean, it is going to, to open the door to the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it, well, here's the thing: is is I'm a big fan of uh, how did this get made? Oh, thanks. You know, and that you know, I listen. You know, every time there's a new episode, I've listened to the Ultraviolet episode. Oh, wow, thank you. Uh, recently, um, uh, but it it kind of I'm a little at odds with it because mm-hmm. I not not the show itself, yeah. but the whole concept of the so bad it's good movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it was Tarantino said something like, "There's no such thing as a, a movie right. that's so bad it's good. You, if it, if you like it, it's good. It's doing its thing." But then I thought you he said that about guilty pleasures. Was it? Was it guilty? I pleasures? thought it was a guilty pleasure thing because he's yeah. like, "There's no such thing as like a guilty pleasure movie because if you like it, you like it." Then, I then think there's no guilt. guilt. Yeah, you exactly. Be, yes, you feel guilty. Not about to it. correct you, I want to still hear your point. Yes. Fine, fuck it, I'm gone. <laughs> so, no, uh, the. Uh, and it, 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 it's you know, because I love certain movies yes. and, you know, certain movies that you've, you've covered, like Maximum Overdrive. Sure. I'll always have a nostalgia for. I can r- acknowledge that it's like unintentionally good. Right. You know, but there I've also seen people kind of attack the the so bad it's good movies with stuff like Rocky Horror Picture Show. And to me, it's like you kind of miss the point. That's that's a comedy. Well, to me, yeah. I, I feel like, you know, how did this get made? We walk this line of. It's saying it's so bad, it's good, but really, it's just a bunch of friends going, "Let's watch this yeah. this week," you know. Yeah, and yeah. sometimes there are going to be movies like The Last Airbender, which are just bad, and yeah. um, and then there'll be other movies that are really fun, like you, like you said, like you know, if you Supeway Camp or something like uh-huh. that. You know, th- I think there's a like for how did this get made? Mm. We are always kind of walking this line of so bad they're good. It's really not even about that for us. It's more like. What would be a fun movie to talk about yeah, with your course. friends? Yeah, so yeah. we kind of like, and sometimes they're really bad. Sometimes they're good, bad, and sometimes they're just, you know, um, bad, bad. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so what we really tried to get with the show in the beginning was, what's the conversation that you have at the diner mm. after you see a good movie or uh, any movie, yeah, you know? Yeah. And we just focus on the bad ones, but we could have the same conversations with good ones too. Yeah. But it's more fun to kind of like figure out the logic of these movies, yeah. I think. Well, yeah, well, and there, there is something to, like, finding the right pieces, right. like, and how they play, because you watch something like The Room, the reason why people uh, grab onto it, and it's why I love Sleepaway Camp, or, mm. you know, uh, even Maximum Overdrive, there's an earnestness to it. I don't think anyone intentionally makes a bad movie, yeah, right? Yeah. I think all intentions are good, and then, you know, there's the exceptions like Sharknado that play into, like, stupidity and stuff yeah. like that, but... Um, you know, that's why, you know, you have a movie like Apocalypse Now mm-hmm. that has a, uh, an equally hellish kind of shoot to what the room was. Yeah. But you get this one product, which is an Academy Award winning, <laughs> you know, uh, seminal film of yeah. our time. And then you have another one, which is uh, you Apocalypse know. Now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, uh, so what what do you think then? What do you look for in, in these movies that that um, you would define as being like? earning the mantle of like a cult status it, to yeah. me it really does there has to be an entertainment value 100%, to it yeah. because like people who say oh you know this movie's just bad it's like i go to a lot of film festivals i see a lot of truly bad movies boring up their ass boring boring movies like a bad movie is a boring movie you forget and never think about again. yeah for us it's yeah. really it's like kind of finding what's going to be the most interesting thing to talk about? Yeah. For example, like Ultraviolet is not one of my favorite movies by any stretch of the yeah. imagination, but the world building, the characters, the concepts are so meaty to kind of <laughs> jump into. Yeah. We often find that like um, movies like that, even talking about uh, Jason X, which is Jason in space, yeah. like it's such a simple, dumb concept. But then when you get, when you really start to break it down and analyze mm. it in a way that, no one was ever intending it to be looked at. That's where I think the fun is, you yeah. know, and we always try to attack movies um, in having fun with it and looking at it from, uh, you know, from a character's perspective or a story's perspective and not just like the cinematography sucked and the acting was bad. Yeah. It's like that's all secondary to us. This is like just kind of like logic problems. Like, wait, mm-hmm. what does that actually mean? <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. No, Ultraviolet was a perfect episode for that because there was so much like detail that you could read about online yeah. that was not anywhere in the movie. Not at all. Yeah. Um, but to me, there also has to be a little bit of, um, of I can't believe I just saw that. Like, mm-hmm. I can't, I can't, uh, Garbage Pail Kids is, is an example that you guys covered. Yeah. It's like, how does this movie exist? Well, to me, it's like, uh, again, it's, there is, 
we you know with how did this get made we always are trying to find a movie that you need to talk to someone about afterwards like yeah. um you know i'm married to june and so we watch these movies together a lot and the hardest thing about watching movies with her and then doing this podcast is like i can't talk to her while the movie's going on i have to wait until we're you mm. know in front of an audience or in front of microphones but it's that kind of sense like wait did you just see what just happened <laughs> did you like you know and i think that is um the fun of it is finding those movies that just give you material. Yeah. Uh, so I assume that your life is a lot of people coming up to you going, you got to cover this. Oh yeah. Is there, is there a movie that, that, uh, that you haven't gotten to yet that you're kind of chomping at the bit? Oh, we have very extensive lists of uh -huh. films and, you know, and again, it's culling through them to find what is the best one of those. Yeah. Right. Cause, um, like the list I have right now, it's like, oh, I heard something about The Haunting, like that uh, the Catherine, 90, yeah, the Catherine Zeta-Jones yeah. one. And I'm like, all right, well, now I got to kind of look at look at it and see what it is, because some movies you'll hear about and they don't ever pay off. Like there's a movie called Never Back Down, which is like Karate mm -hmm. Kid, but with MMA. Uh -huh. And it's great for the first 30 minutes. And then it just becomes like an MMA fighting. And it's not bad. It's like it's sort of like it's just funny because it's yeah. like still high spirited, like yeah. Karate Kid, like. They're, they're doing something, but it's MMA fights, so it's so violent, you know, but it doesn't kind of make Isn't the Isn't that like Josh Holloway or something from uh, the guy from Lost? I don't think he's in it. I think it's more he, young kids, uh, right? He, he was in, I guess, maybe a dance, like a step-up oh, okay. style dance movie. Oh, maybe step-up movies confusing. are my favorite. Um, yeah. But yeah, so it's like we have um, some really amazing people who work on the show that watch and, and kind of help us critique and, mm. and drill down because people will always tell us, like, what's the movie that people tell us to watch all the time? And I'm like, that's a good movie that's the other thing too mm -hmm. movies that are a little bit outside of the norm be like that sucked and it's like no that's just a, yeah. a really cool artistic movie that yeah. You, yeah that you're not on board with yeah. yeah well i have a suggestion i'm not sure if you've done it mm -hmm. yet but there's a movie called making contact it was oh, also released as joey it was roland emmerich's like one of his first movies oh wow okay it's him ripping off et and poltergeist at the same time whoa that sounds amazing it it is like bonkers I it love is it. legit bananas <laughs> so that that is one that i think you could have a lot of fun with there's like a haunted house that eats like bully kids and i'm in it's, it's crazy oh man so, a live so action monster house I'm, i can't wait <laughs> um so l i think we should talk a little bit about um uh just backtrack a little bit and talk mm -hmm. a little bit about disaster artists and i'd like to kind of get a feeling and i'm sure this is the tip of a question that you've been getting a lot today but like how far back do you go with the room because you know, i know that it was an early uh, how did this get made it was within that first yeah realm. That first year um yeah. you know for me the room is kind of like an ayahuasca experience right oh, yeah. you hear about people seeing this thing you don't know exactly what it's like and then all of a sudden you go with like a group of friends and you have to go with people it's yeah. a group experience and i believe the first time i watched it I was in a house with a bunch of people. We watched it together. And we're like, oh my God, what did we just watch? Mm -hmm. So much so that the next night we watched it again <laughs> yeah. to kind of make sense of it. And I feel like um, that was my first experience. And then I went to go see it in a theater where people had the spoons and yelling at the screen. And that was a fully different experience that I think I appreciated more because I watched it in the quietness of my own mm -hmm. home first. Yeah. And then over the years, you revisit it. And it's, it's one of those rare bad films that is so enjoyable. Yeah. You, every time you watch it, it gets uh, better and better. So I think I probably found the movie like 2006, 2007 yeah. in that era, you know, so a little bit after the the heat of it and then have just kind of been fascinated by it. When Greg Sestero came on our podcast, yeah. he kind of blew my mind because he revealed like this other layer of the film and, and you start to understand like, Oh, all these choices that were made in the room were actually based on something from this guy, Tommy's life. Yeah. And the book then further kind of illuminated that. And I was a big fan of the book. And then when I got to be a part of this, uh, the first table read of the script, I was like, this is really, really fun. It, it just they encapsulated what was so kind of amazing about the movie and everything. But they told it in a way that is not super inside baseball either. Yeah. It's, you know, I always describe uh, the room as being like um, bizarro la la land, you know, <laughs> like here are people that have dreams and ambitions and want to make something good. 
and they make it, but you know, their reach just exceeds their grasp, yeah. you know, like, but they did make something great, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, there's nothing that separates, you know, uh, you know, Christopher Nolan and Tommy Wiseau, like the desire to tell stories, mm -hmm. to make something, to put people in it that they believe in and they trust. Yeah. It's just the product that is vastly, vastly <laughs> different. Yeah. It, well, in, in watching somebody that like desperately wants something, you, you're automatically, they're the underdog. You're yes. automatically in their court. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, I guess that's part of the reason why I have a little bit of an issue with the so bad is good because it kind of feels like you're putting people are putting themselves into a position of superiority to right. a movie. And I think a lot of people who are fans of the room like it from that level. But you when you watch it, that, that's when I why I keep saying earnestness. There's an absolute oh, earnestness in it, in it. And I think that's why the heart of disaster artist is so strong because you feel for Tommy, it, you know, when he finally has his big moment in the theater yeah. watching his movie, you feel for him. Well, you know? I think that's the testament to Franco. Uh, yeah. He brings humanity to a very larger than life character yeah. that you can actually feel for him and see his emotional journey. And, and he's not just this big goofy guy. And yeah. I think there's, you know, I think there's a way where you could make this like Bowfinger, you know, yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. which is a movie I love. But it doesn't have the heart that I think Disaster Artist brings yeah. to it. And you know, you're you're right about that term, like um, you know, so bad it's good. I think we just have not like developed a better term <laughs> for a movie that is not like I think you're used to saying like, oh, Phantom Threat. That is a great movie. Mm. You know, uh, I consider like Fast and Furious in the same category as Sleepaway Camp. It's mm -hmm. just movies that I enjoy. Yeah, yeah. they're not high art. You know, and I guess maybe yeah. it's like it's enjoyable. It's weird. It's like, but it's like it pays yeah. off on a different level. And know? it's trying for something. Sleepaway Camp, especially, is yeah. like so way ahead of the curve when it comes to like gay issues and oh, absolutely. and all this stuff, all under the the skin of what is just a, a Friday the Thirteenth ripoff. Yes, a hundred percent. And by the way, it's so funny. I recently watched Sleepaway Camp. Yeah. I hadn't seen it before, and it's so uh, amazing to watch the comparisons between that and Wet Hot American Summer. <laughs> like literally the outfits and the characters look like they are out of that movie. It's like, I wish somebody would cut a movie where it's like they're existing simul, like they're <laughs> existing uh, within each other. The, the, it's the neighboring camp. Yeah, exactly. Like you got the or rich just, camp, you got- Or it's like Rosencrantz and Gildersern. It's like, <laughs> yes. you know, it's like that's going on while this is going on. Yeah. Uh, but the, yeah, not not as many pedophile chefs in uh, <laughs> in Wet Hot. Well, look, thankfully. I mean, he's talking to the can. You know, who That's knows true. what's going on? Yeah, <laughs> we don't know Isn't how old that can fridge? is. Are they, aren't they fucking a refrigerator in that? Yeah, I guess <laughs> he's like he's a uh, yeah. These guys has other issues going on. <laughs> um, so you. Uh, so you said you were part of the uh, an early table read. Is that that's like you? So you've been part of this movie, yeah, from the very you know, beginning. Um, I've been very lucky to be working with uh, you know uh, Seth and Evan, you know, who you know are behind mm. uh, everything kind of great uh, of late, mm -hmm. and uh, and so they called me in, and I'd never had met uh, Franco before, mm -hmm. and we did a table read and a note session. But he came to that table read, fully realized this Tommy Wiseau at that point. And when you heard him read, you're like, whoa, this is going to be great. And a lot of that beginning work was, A, do people know what this, what this movie is? Mm -hmm. like, and, that, and I think that, that's always been a question, because like, the movie isn't well known. So how do you mm -hmm. let people know that? And I think you know, Seth uh, and Evan and, and the writers did a great job at saying, like, let's put some important people in the front to tell you that this movie is worthwhile. When you see J.J. Yeah. Abrams at the top of this movie going, <laughs> this is an important movie, or, you know, you see Keegan and Michael Key, or you see Adam Scott, or you see Kevin Smith. Granted, there's somebody up there that you're going to be like, oh, I like one of these people. Mm. It's like their version of Robert Osborne. You know, it's like, oh, yep. <laughs> this is why it's important. Yeah. And, uh, and so I think that was, like, the entry point. Like, and, and letting people know this is, like, a real thing. It's uh, I mean, it's interesting that you talk about how uh, how uh, Franco had already like embodied him way back then, yeah. because, uh, again, I, it's funny, like you if you had asked me, you know, before the South by screening, like, you know, Oscar talk for James Franco playing yeah. Tommy Wiseau, I'd be like, oh, yeah, ha, ha, funny, funny. Yeah. Uh, but you see the movie and you're like, no, that's that's actually legit. I think he you know, he, it's again, I keep hammering on this, but it's the heart. You know, e even when uh, Tommy does shitty things in the movie, you know why he's doing it. I, 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 I go back and say this again, like Tommy or I'll just say that I think the thing that's masterful about the way that James 
uh, I would say, directed himself. Mm -hmm. And also, by the way, I would say he's the first in-character director of all time, oh, yeah, right? Like the I, I am going actors. to ask you about that. Yeah, sure. um, but like, but yeah. you know, he, he, this is a character that could be viewed as a caricature, and to humanize that, yeah, and and keep it real and based in reality, it's like, it's it's such a fine line that he walked, and that he can get you to feel it. it really, yeah. it, it's big. It's a big deal. And well, I mean, so I mean, you brought it up, but I was absolutely going to get to that because I ha I've only heard the he stayed in character but like i don't know what that means well Tim, I, did did he was he I in character as james franco as tommy directing or was he actually trying to direct as tommy was in? this is like, i think the big misconception okay, about good. this james franco was in character he was in voice in right voice. Okay. so um it you could talk to james franco yeah but he just had tommy Wiseau's voice yeah so when the minute he stepped on st uh set every day yeah he was fully tommy i never saw james as James the entire time I mm. shot in that movie. And I yeah. shot for like a month. And I only saw him as Tommy. So I only heard him as Tommy. And I think that was for him to, you know, he's in this full getup and he kept it. And one of the cool things that he did in directing the film is when we were doing the, the room segments, yeah. um, it was shot a little bit like uh, a documentary. Cameras were running. Mm -hmm. We were doing a lot of one shots yeah. that then we'd kind of pull in for coverage. But it, it gave you a sense that you were always on camera everything was going on scenes were going on very long and and fat and i think that really helped keep the sense of movement going around like it was like uh, the way they talk about the office like mm. everyone was doing their job at all points because you never knew you when the camera was going to find yeah, you yeah. and uh, so i think james needed to do never drop out of that tommy voice so we'd we'd be doing something and then he'd be like cut and then no this is james cut and you're like oh okay got it like <laughs> like we didn't know yeah. because it was sort of like you kind of had to like wait for that clue because it was it wasn't like a traditional like action cut. You know, it was mm. like we were just rolling in and, and letting things breathe. Well, I, I have to assume that that also helped him in his perform because he didn't want to make it a caricature. Right. Right. And um, yeah. And I've talked to a couple of actors on set that, you know, like, oh, I didn't realize until later they were British. Because right. even between, you know, they, right. they didn't want to drop the accent. They they were worried if they kept switching back and forth, it would bleed. Oh, I had that in uh, I did Veep uh, this last season mm. and I was on there with Indi uh, India. I forgot if I mispronounced her last name, but uh, De Beaufort, I, bless, I believe. But it, like all of a sudden she spoke in her British accent. I was like, what? I did, like, <laughs> and I would work with her for like eight weeks at that point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so one of your biggest scenes in this movie uh, is uh, you. It's the big confrontation scene yeah. you have with Tommy, and the whole time he's wearing nothing but a cock sock. Yes. So my question is, did that kind of make it easier or harder for you to to play that scene? Because your character obviously would have to be uncomfortable with it. Yeah. Well, you know what's interesting is I think that my character in the film, I'm the DP, mm. and I think I am. One no, of that's the director oh, of photography. Oh, yes. It. There you go. Sorry. For, I'm for you porn fans out there, that doesn't mean <laughs> what you think it means. Uh, I am one <laughs> of the only voices of reason that really like goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. And yeah. I think, again, going back to that idea that he was shooting these very long takes. So we shot that scene, the whole sex scene. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so the, the time I blow up with him is during the sex scene where he's kind of being a little bit uh, abusive to one of the actresses. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he comes in and there's an energy. So it's like it allowed us all to see it. Like when, when he came on set, mm -hmm. camera was rolling and he was naked. So <laughs> the first time I saw him, we were in that moment. And I think that, that again, that energy was really helpful because yeah. it's like you're first seeing that, then you're seeing him be really, uh, you know, rude to Ari's character and the, and everything's building and the energy is building. And I think yeah. that that was one of the things that he did that was really kind of nice because it, it everything was exploding and working at the same time. Yeah. It, it, you know, I mean, it, and it kind of comes through cause it's, it, it, the tone of the movie shifts in that scene. Right. Like that, that that's a, that's a scene where you, you start feeling like, Ooh, right. It, it does kind of take right. you back. And it's a com I mean, it's a comedy. The movie's right. very funny, but there is that, that, that moment where things come to a head. Yeah. I think yeah. it's, you know, yeah, I think it, it's sort of like, you realize like, oh, these are real people and this is not, he, well, he's not treating these people well. Yeah. So what, what was the overall vibe on the set? What, did it kind of feel like friends playing around or since you are so familiar with 
the movie, did it kind of feel like you were like stepped into a time machine and, and went back to the you know, I, I think to Seth and Evan's credit, you know, they produced the movie uh, and James, you know, was very hands on in every aspect of it. They created a cast unlike any other. It was yeah. like when you look at this cast, like pound for pound from <laughs> Melanie Griffith to Sharon Stone to John Early, you know, uh, Nathan Fielder, you know, Josh Husterson, Zac Efron, you know, June Diane Rayfield, Jason Manzoukas, myself, like all these people. It's like what an amazing group of people they put together. There's not a face that you see that you don't recognize. And you yeah. don't feel like it is done in a like, check out who this person is, you yeah. know, which I think is a tricky thing. So I think that they, they did a great job of creating, uh, bringing together fun people who really like working together. Yeah. So that was, it made, it made lunches fun. It made being on set fun. And uh, I would also say that uh, to answer your other question, like being there, it was kind of like going to your own personal Disney World. It was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, these are the sets of the room. These yeah. are as crappy as the sets of the room were, you know, because that's yeah. the other thing too. It's easy to recreate the sets of the room. They're terrible, <laughs> yeah. you know, but to be there and be on it. And and we were in the same Burns and Sawyer studio or nearby. Like we, there was a lot of parallels that we were really uh, recreating there. It was really cool. Nice. And, and it bleeds through, I guess, you know, and the, the authenticity. Because, I mean, it's, after I saw the South by screening, I went home and I watched yeah. the the room again. I, they they played it right after, but it was like I had right at that point you're gonna be up until four in the morning. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, but like I I did like rewatch it and it's it, it's nuts. Like it's it it almost makes me wish that they can double feature. This I think going the plan out. is going yeah. to be uh, to do a lot of like double features in the future. Yeah. Huh. Well, I mean it, it it's it's fitting, especially yeah. when you watch watch the end. Uh, did they actually reshoot, like essentially recreate? the entirety of the movie or did they only do the, ch the chunks? Um, I think there's about 45 to 50 minutes of <laughs> the movie that was recreated. And, you know, yeah. they were so um, specific about that. And, yeah. you know, again, it was creating this like real sense of a living set. Like yeah. I was looking at monitors that were plugged directly into the camera. So we had an HD monitor and we had a 35 millimeter monitor. <laughs> and so they were all working. Everything was going on and they would shoot these scenes and then immediately run over to the film disaster artist's monitors yeah. and they would be playing the old the they play the scene side by side and be able to really make sure that every head move every line every touch every breath was accounted for and yeah. it was very exacting uh, i think that was a, probably the hardest uh, most stressful part of the the shoot is just like getting those scenes yeah well i mean I, i'm very excited for people to not only see this movie but like then kind of discover Oh yeah, uh, the room and like that's gonna be to me the most fun part of the movie coming out is is the reaction of people who'd never heard of the room. I think the it's Robert Picardos of this world. Yeah, no, yeah. I think it's going to be one of those things where, you know, Tommy in this amazing ability to continue to fall upwards <laughs> is going to have the most success he's ever kind of experienced by the fact that this movie is bringing so much attention to the room, yeah. which you can still only buy through Tommy. You yeah. know, so like you know, you got to get it that way. Yep, great. So, um, so what do you got coming up next? What's the next? Uh, um, right now, I am uh, working on Galaxy Quest, uh, a TV series for Amazon, which is uh, kind of the continuation of Galaxy Quest, but also um, more in the vein of like Blade Runner Two or um, or Force Awakens, where you're you're. So Harrison Ford's going to be in it, is what you're saying. I'm basically saying Harrison yeah. Ford is going to be in it. Yeah. Yeah. So we're like you know we're introducing new characters. We're uh, paying homage to not even homage we're continuing the story of the first so that's, that's been awesome. really fun and hopefully we'll get to actually make it which will be really yeah, fun that's i mean galaxy quest is a great movie and it's a great movie to watch big oh yeah uh, too because they do they play with the aspect ratios on that it's one of the few films i've actually noticed that on yeah it's a it's yeah. a really uh, you know we're so we're trying to do some cool stuff with it hopefully that will work out and then um I'm going to be in this new movie that stars Chance the Rapper, oh. uh, also made by A24 called Slice. Nice. And it's a werewolf comedy. There's a lot. of. It's very cool. Like, mm. it's a very cool, undescribable movie. I was trying to describe it to somebody. And I was like, yeah, and then that, and then that, and, and mm. then that. It, it, it's going to be cool. Nice. So I think that uh, that just about does it for okay, us. Okay, is that good? All I right. I think we're good. All right. Um, yeah. So I think uh, the movie comes out December first. December first uh, in select yes. theaters and December eighth nationally. Yeah, and you can go buy the room right now from Tommy's website. And make sure you get a pair of Tommy's 
uh, amazingly comfortable underwear, which is no joke. They are very comfortable. Even more comfortable than MeUndies? Look, I don't want to say anything <laughs> against my sponsors of how did this get made, <laughs> but I'm just saying, you know what? They may have a, a strong competitor in Tommy Wiseau's, uh, whatever he calls his underwear. I forget <laughs> what they call called. Tommy's underpants. Yeah, Tommy's underpants. Cool. Well, thanks for, for uh, chatting with me. Oh, I really it was my it. pleasure. And like I said, I... Uh, if you're not following this guy on Twitter, get on get on board. I know. I got the holiday guide coming up again through uh, it's my favorite stuff, thing. Yeah. Your holiday guide. Can you give me one thing that you can that you that you know me? What would I like on this? Oh, holiday my guide? goodness. OK, so I, I, I haven't found that thing that's usually the great jokey. Thing. Right. Like there was one year where I put in a, uh, a cookbook that looked like any other cookbook. Uh, but when you actually like click on it and follow through the link, it's actually all recipes made with semen. That's um, and so I, I made a big joke post about it. And actually, I got emails from people who actually did buy the cookbook, oh, not realizing that it was hilarious. a semen cookbook. Uh, there's lots of really good uh, Stranger things stuff. There's got lots it. of good. Uh, Is uh, the Seinfeld uh, apartment set on your gift list? It, it is now. <laughs> I feel like that's a really uh, interesting uh, thing for people who are big Seinfeld fans, that recreation set. It, yeah, so it's something you can build yourself? It's like uh, No, it's a pre-built like, diorama of Seinfeld's apartment. It's pretty it's cool like looking. like a 130th scale or yes, something? Yes, exactly. And the other thing I'm going to say... Uh, yeah, give me, give me, a, give me a suggestions hmm. for sure. Remember there was one year where I did like there was a, a tote from Raiders of the Lost Ark candle where you I have that in my yeah, office. Yeah, where you like, light it that. and then it's, it like melts and he, his face melts. It's yeah. it is it yeah. is on my desk right now in my office. Um, I mean, I feel like porgs are going to be a big thing. I mean, it would have to be jokey something like. Yeah, you know, I just haven't found that great jokey part, you know, to it. And I also like doing that super rich only oh, section yeah, where it's like you buy this nuclear sub from the U.S. government or it's whatever. Amazing. So, well, if yeah. I could get on that super rich segment, I would say I would want to buy the dolphin from Johnny Mnemonic, which oh. is available uh, for sale right now for I think it's going for five thousand pounds from like prop store or something. Yes. All right, so if you want to get uh, Paul <laughs> an early Christmas present. Get me the Delphin from Johnny Mnemonic, please. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much, man. Thank you so Th much. It was a pleasure. It's been a fun, fun yeah. chat. Awesome. Cool.